live from Austin, Texas. It's the Cube, covering KubeCon and Cloud Native Con 2017. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Linux Foundation, and the Cube's ecosystem partners. Welcome back. This is SiliconANGLE Media's live coverage, wall to wall, of KubeCon and Cloud Native Con here in Austin, Texas. Got the house band rocking all day. Uh, I'm Stu Miniman, happy to be joined on the program. Dan Walsh, who's consulting engineer with Red Hat, rocking the Red Hat. Yeah. Dan, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. All right, so we've you know, Red Hat has a strong presence at the show. We had Clayton on yesterday, you know, top contributor, won an award actually for all the contribution he's done here. Uh, going through a lot of angles. Why don't you start with, tell us, you know, kind of your role, what you've yeah, been doing so, at Red Hat. So at Red Hat, I'm a consulting engineer. It basically means I lead a team of about 20 engineers and we work on uh, the base operating system. Basically, all anything to do with containers uh, from the operating system on down. So kernel engineers, um, but everything underneath Kubernetes. All right. So um, traditionally for the last four and a half years I've been working on the Docker project, um, as well as other container type efforts. We've added things like file system support, uh, Docker, uh, lots of kernel changes, lots of, you know, we're working forever on user namespace, things like that. Uh, more recently though, we've been working, um, we started to work on uh, sort of uh, one of the, well, OpenShift and Kubernetes have, uh, were built on top of Docker originally, and they found over time that the Docker base was changing in ways that were continuously breaking Kubernetes. So about a year and a half ago, we started to work on a project called Cryo. Um, the, uh, so a little history is, uh, uh, if you go back, Kubernetes was originally built on top of Docker, but CoreOS came to, the Core, uh, to Kubernetes and wanted to get rocket support into Kubernetes. And rather than add rocket support, um, Kubernetes decided to find this uh, interface, basically a, a, a CRI, Container Runtime Interface, mm -hmm. which is an API that they would call out to to run containers. Um, so Rocket could build a Container Runtime Interface. They actually built a shim for, for the Docker API. Um, but we decided at that time to basically build our own uh, one, and we call it the Cryo, so it's Container Runtime Interface for OCI images. So the, the, the plan was to build a very minimal, a minimalist daemon that could support uh, Kubernetes and Kubernetes alone. So we don't support any other um, orchestrations or anything else. It's totally based on, um, on Kubernetes CRI. Uh, so our versioning matches up with Kubernetes, so Kubernetes uh, 1.8, you get Cryo 1.8. Kubernetes 1.9, you get Cryo 1.9. Yeah, so Dan, you know, we, we, we've been talking about this. You know, Red Hat made a pretty strong bet on, on Kubernetes, yeah. uh, you know, relatively early in right. there. Uh, you know, Red Hat, very open, you know, everything you do is 100% open source, so, uh, you know, why, you know, for, for Cryo, why only Kubernetes? You know, there, there's other orchestrations out there that, that are open source, yeah. So, so you know, uh, well, let, let's take a step back. So one of, one of our goals, um, and my group was to take sort of what, what does it mean to run a container? Um, so if you think about when I run a container, what do I need? I need a standard container image format. So there's the OCI image bundle format that defines that. The next thing I need is the ability to pull an image from a container registry to the host. Uh, so we built a library called um, Containers Image that actually implements all of the capabilities of moving uh, containers back and forth around, uh, but basically at a command line or a library level. We built a tool on top of that called Scopio, which allows us to basically command line. I can move from one container registry to another. I can move container registries to different kinds of storage. I can move directly from a container registry into a Docker daemon. So we have a, so the next step you need when you want to run a container is uh, storage. So you need to take that container image and put it on disk. And in the case of containers, you do that on top of what's called the copy on write file system. So you need to be able to have a layering file system. So we created another project called Container Storage that allowed you to uh, basically store those images on storage. The last step for running a container is actually to launch an OCI runtime. So we, OCI uh, runtime specification and run C takes care of that. So we have the four building components for what, what it means to run a container is sep separate. So we're building other tools around that, but we built one tool that was focused on Kubernetes. Um, and again, the reason Red Hat bet on Kubernetes is we felt that we had the best long-term potential in 
judging by this show, I think we, we made a, a sane bet. Um, but we, get, we will work with others. I mean, these are all fully open source projects. We actually have contributors coming in that are contributing at these low level tools. Uh, for instance, Pivotal is a major contributor in containing an image, and they're using it for pulling images into their base. We have uh, other products that projects are using it. So it's just not Kubernetes, it's just that cryo is, is a demon for Kubernetes. Yeah, Dan, it's really interesting. You listened in uh, Clayton's keynote this morning. He talked about one of the goals you have at Red Hat is making that underlying infrastructure boring right. so that everything above it, you know, just can right. rely on right. it and works on. There's a lot of work that goes yeah. on uh, under there. So it, it, it's like, you know, it's, it's the, the, the plumbers and the mechanics right. uh, down underneath making sure it all works. A lot of, a lot of times when I give talks, the, the number one thing I'm always trying to teach people is that containers are not anything really significantly different. Uh, containers are just processes on a Linux system. So if you booted up a, a regular RHEL system right now and you looked at a uh, PID1 of, of a system, you know, a, if you, well, I, let me take a step back. I define containers as being something that has C groups associated with it, resource constraints, it has some security constraints associated with it, and it has these things called namespaces, which is a virtualization layer that gives you a different view of the processes. If you looked at every process on a Linux system, they all have SUI groups associated with them. They all have security constraints associated with them, and they all have namespaces associated with them. So if you went to PID1, if you went to slash proc PID1 uh, uh, slash NS, you would see the namespaces associated with PID1. So that means that every process on Linux is a in a container. You know, by the definition of a container being those three things. And all that happens on the system is you, you toggle those. So you can tighten them or change some of the namespace and stuff like that. And that gives you the feel of the virtualization. Um, but bottom line is they're all, they're all containers. So all the tools like Docker, Rocket, Cryo, RunC, any one of those tools are all just basically going into the kernel, configuring the kernel, and then launching the PID1 on the system. And from that point on, it's just the kernel that's taking them. So we had, Red Hat has a t-shirt that we often wear that says Linux is containers and containers is Linux, and that actually proves the point. So, so bottom line is, you know, the operating system is key, and my team and the developers I work with in the open source community is all about how can we make containers better? How can we further constrain these processes? How can we create new namespaces? How can we create new C groups, new uh, stuff like that? So it's all low level stuff. Yeah, yeah. Dan, uh, we, we, you know, give us a give us some flavor as to some of the customer conversations you're having at the show here. What, you know, where are they? I mean, we know it's a, a spectrum uh, of, uh, you know, where they are, but what, what are some of the commonalities that you're hearing? And I mean, uh, at Red Hat, our customers run the gamut, so, you know, I've, we have customers who can barely get off of RHEL 5, which came out you know, 12 years ago, <laughs> um, to you know, sort of the leading edge uh, customers. And, and, and the funny thing is that a lot of these are in the same companies. So most of, our com most of our customers at this point are just beginning to move into the container world. You know, they might have um, a few containers running, or they, they have the developers insisting, hey, this container stuff's cool, I want to stop playing with it. Um, but getting them from that step to the step of, say, Kubernetes, or to get into the step of OpenShift, is sort of a, a big leap. Um, my fear with a lot of this is, is a lot of people are concentrating too much on the containers. You know, the bottom line is what people need to do is develop applications and, and secure applications. I actually, my history is, is very based in, in heavy security. Um, so really, I, we, you know, we face a lot of customers who sort of have homegrown environments, and they, they, their engineers come in and say, oh, I want to do a Docker build, or I want to talk to the Docker socket. And I always look at that and, and question, you know, you're, you're supposed to be building apps, you're building banking apps, or you're building military apps, or you're building um, you know, medical apps. You know, they should be concentrating on that and not so much on the containers. And that's actually the beauty of OpenShift, is you can set up OpenShift work, workflows in such a way that their interaction to build a container is just a git check it. And it's not, you know, you don't have to go out and understand what it means to build a container. You don't have to get the knowledge and 
um, of what it means to be able to build a container and things like that. Well, Dan, you, know, Dan you bring up a really good point. At this show, most of the customers I'm talking about, it's really about you know, the speed for them to be able to deliver on the right. applications. Yes, there's the people building all the, the, the tooling and the projects here, and there's many customers that are involved with it, but um, it, we've got further up the stack where it's closer to the application, right. less to uh, kind of that, that underlying infrastructure. Right. And a lot of, uh, the other thing customers are looking for, in my case, as I said, I have a strong background in security. I did SC Linux for like 13 years, so m most of my time talking to customers is about security and you know, how can we actually confine containers, how do we keep them under control, and especially when they go to multi-tenancy. And, and it's a good thing, that I, I don't know if you're going to talk to Kata, have you heard about the Kata project? So we, we, we've talked to a couple of people, Kata yeah. coming out of the open, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, clear containers. Yeah, and, yeah, clear containers with Intel. And yeah, and, and I, I think th those, getting to those levels of, of using hardware isolation yeah, well, it really helps out in um, It's interesting, because that's, you know, when first looking at it, it's like, wait, it's kind of a lightweight VM, it's yeah. a container, it, does it, you know, where does but that fit? They're, they're and not really, they're really just containers. Yeah. It's, they're not, um, a lightweight VM would be actually booting up like an init system and running, you know, logging and all these other things. Okay. So a Kata container, or I'm more familiar with clear, clear, clear containers. A clear container is literally just running a very small init system, and then it launches Run C to run actually start up the container. Yeah. So it has almost no operating system inside of the, you know, lightweight VM. Yeah. As opposed to running just regular virtual machines. Yeah, Dan, yeah. would love your take on you know you talked about security, uh, you know, <laughs> security of containers, you know, the role of security in yeah. the cloud native space. You know, what, what what are you seeing, and what do we need to work on even more as an industry? Yeah, uh, it's funny because. My, my world view is, is at a much lower level than other security people that would talk, because other security people would be looking at sort of network isolation and, and you know, role-based access control inside of Kubernetes. I look at it as basically multi-tenancy, so running multiple containers with different workloads, and what happens if one container gets hacked, um, how does that affect the other containers that are running, and how do I protect the services? Um, so, uh, over the years when we've been working with Docker, I got SE Linux support in, we've gotten SecCom support in. We're trying to take advantage of everything in the Linux kernel to further tighten the security. But the bottom line is a process inside of the container is talking to the real kernel on the host. Any vulnerability in the host kernel could lead to an escalation and a breakout. So that's why, no matter what you say, a hyper, uh, uh, like a hypershell or a, a, a separate container running inside of a VM is always going to be more secure. But, that being, uh, on the other hand, containers, in a lot of cases, you want to have some interaction. If you go all the way to VM, you get really bad isolation, so, so it, you really have to cover the gamut. So a lot of times I'll tell people to look at containers as being a, you know, you, you, they're not a zero sum game. You don't have to throw away all your VMs to move to containers. Um, I, I tell people the most secure way to run a application is separate physical hardware. The second most is on VMs. The third most is inside of containers. Um, and then you know you can go on to all down the line. But there's nothing to say that you can't run your containers inside of separate VMs inside of separate physical machines. So. Um, so you can set up your, your environment in such a way, say you have your web front end sitting inside of VMs inside of Demilitarized Zone on separate physical hardware. You set up your databases with your credit card data on separate physical machines, separate VMs inside, on separate containers inside of you. So you can build up these really high levels of security uh, based on containers, virtualization, and physical, physical hardware. So. I can go on forever on this stuff. So, yeah, well, yeah. Dan, Dan Walsh, really appreciate uh, yep. sharing some of the ways that Red Hat's trying to help some of those underlying pieces become boring, so that yep. customers won't have to that's worry all, about. That's, that's really what it's about. If you know what's going on at the host level, then I haven't done my job. So I'm, the, right. our goal is to basically take that host level and make it disappear, and you, know, you can work at your higher level orchestration level. All right, well Dan, it's great to catch up with you. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be back with lots more coverage here from KubeCon 2017 in Austin, Texas. I'm Stu Miniman, and you're watching theCUBE.